So hello everyone and welcome back to Neatopedia that is Neat ka Encyclopedia and we are back with our physics audio books aur maine channel analytics mein ek cheez dekha ki sari playlist mein se jo sabse zyada playlist logo ko pasand aa rahi hai that is physics audio book playlist so okay we'll move on with physics audio books only so let's begin with chapter 1 electrostats please note that modern physics ac emi em waves everything has been finished on our channel already you can check it out in the physics audio book playlist on our channel or just click on that i button and you'll get the link to it let's begin with chapter 1 electric charges and field 1.1 introduction all of us have the experience of seeing a spark or hearing a crackle when we take off our synthetic clothes or sweater particularly in dry weather this is almost inevitable with ladies garments like polyester saree Have you ever tried to find any explanation for this phenomenon? Another common example of electric discharge is the lightning that we see in the sky during thunderstorms. We also experience a sensation of an electric shock either while opening a door of a car or holding an iron bar of a bus just after sliding from a seat. The reason for these experiences is discharge of electric charges through our body which has accumulated due to rubbing or insulating surfaces. You might have also heard that this is due to the generation of static electricity. This is precisely the topic we are going to discuss in this and the next chapter. Static means anything that does not move or change with time. Electrostatics deals with the study of forces, fields and potentials start arising from static charges. 1.2 electric charge. Historically the credit of discovery for the fact that amber rubbed with wool or silk cloth attracts light objects goes to the tales of Miletus Greece around 600 BC. The name electricity is coined from the Greek word electron meaning amber. Many such pairs of materials were known which on rubbing could attract light objects like straw, pith balls and bits of paper. You can perform the following activity at home to experience an effect cut out a long strip of white paper and lightly iron them take them near a tv screen or a computer monitor you will see that the strips get attracted to the screen in fact they remain stuck to the screen for a while it was observed that if two glass rods rubbed with wool or silk cloth are brought close to each other they repel each other the two strands of wool or two pieces of silk cloth with which the rods were rubbed also repel each other however the glass rod and the wool attracted each other similarly two plastic rods rubbed with cat's fur repel each other but attracted the fur on the other hand plastic rod attracts the glass rod and repels the silk or wool with which the glass rod was rubbed the glass rod repels the fur if a plastic rod rubbed with fur is made to touch two small pith balls suspended by a silk or nylon thread then the balls repel each other and also repel by the rod A similar effect is found in the pith balls that are touched with glass rod rubbed with silk. A dramatic observation is that pith ball touched with the glass rod attracts another pith ball touched with the plastic rod. These seemingly simple facts were established from years of efforts and careful experiments and their analysis. It was concluded after many years of careful studies by different scientists that there were only two kinds of an entity which is called the electric charge we say that the bodies like glass or plastic rod silk fur and pith balls are electrified they acquire an electric charge on rubbing the experiments on the pith ball suggested that there are two kinds of electrification and we find that number 1 like charges repel and number 2 unlike charges attract each other the experiments also demonstrated that the charges are transformed from the rods to the pith balls on contact It is said that the pith balls are electrified or are charged by contact. The property which differentiates the two kind of charges is called the polarity of charge. When a glass rod is rubbed with silk, the rod acquires one kind of charge and the silk acquires the second kind of charge. This is true for any pair of objects that are rubbed to be electrified. Now, if the electrified glass rod is brought in contact with the silk with which it was rubbed, they no longer attract each other. they also do not attract or repel the other light objects that they did on being electrified thus the charges acquired after rubbing are lost when the charges are brought together in contact what can you conclude from these observations it just tells that an unlike charges acquired by the objects neutralize or nullify each other's effect 
Therefore, the charges were named as positive and negative by American scientist Benjamin Franklin. We know that when we add a positive number to a negative number of the same magnitude, the sum is zero. This might have been a philosophy in naming charges as positive and negative. By convention, the charges on glass rod or cat's fur is called positive and that on the plastic rod or silk is termed negative. If an object possesses an electric charge, it is said to be electrified or charged. When it has no charge, it is said to be electrically neutral. A simple apparatus to detect a charge in a body is the gold leaf electroscope. It consists of a vertical metal rod housed in a box with two thin gold leaves attached to its bottom end. When a charged object touches the metal knob of the top of the rod, the charge flows on to the leaves of and they diverge. The degree of divergence is an indicator of the amount of charge. Students can make a simple electroscope as follows. Take a thin aluminium curtain rod with ball ends fitted up for hanging the curtain. Cut out a piece of length of about 20 cm with ball at one end and flatten the curtain end. Take a large bottle that is can hold the rod and a cork which fit the opening of the bottle. Make a hole in the cork sufficient to hold the curtain long slightly. Slide the rod through the hole in the cork with the cut end on the lower side and the ball end projecting above the cork. Fold a small thin aluminium foil in the middle and attach to the flattened end of the rod by cellulose tape. This forms the leaf of your electroscope. Fit the cork in the bottle with about 5 cm of the ball end projecting above the cork. A paper scale may be put inside the bottle in advance to measure the separation of the leaves. The separation is a rough measure of the amount of charge on the electroscope. To understand how the electroscope works, use a white paper strips we used for seeing the attraction of the charged bodies. Fold the paper strips into half so that you can make a mark of the fold. Open the strip and iron it lightly with the mountain fold up. Hold the strip by pinching it at the fold. You will notice that the two halves move apart. This shows that the strip has acquired charge on ironing. When you fold it in two halves, both these halves have the same charge, hence they repel each other. The same effect is seen on the leaf electroscope. On charging the curtain rod by touching the ball end with an electrified body, the charge is transferred to the curtain rod and the attached aluminium foil. Both the halves of the foil get similar charge and therefore repel each other. The divergence in the leaves depends upon the amount of charge on them. Let us first try to understand why material bodies acquire charge. You know that all metal is made up of atoms or molecules. Although normally the materials are electrically neutral, they do not contain any charge, but the charges are exactly balanced. Forces that hold the molecules together and the forces that hold atoms together in a solid, the adhesive force of glue forces associated with surface tension all are basically electrical in nature, arising from the forces between charged particles. Thus, the electric force is all perseveres and it encompasses almost each and every field associated in our life. It is therefore essential that we learn more about such a force. To electrify a neutral body, we need to add or remove one kind of charge. When we say that a body is charged, we always refer to this as excess charge or deficit of charge. In solids, some of the electrons being less tightly bound in an atom are the charges which are transferred from one body to the other. A body can thus be charged positively by losing some electrons. Similarly, a body can be charged negatively by gaining some electrons. When we rub a glass rod with silk, some of the electrons from the rod are transferred to the silk cloth. Thus, the rod gets positively charged and the silk gets negatively charged. No new charge is created in the process of rubbing. Also, the number of electrons that are transferred is a very small fraction of the total number of electrons in the material body. Also, only the less tightly bound electrons in a material can be transferred from it by another by rubbing. Therefore, when a body is rubbed with another, bodies get charged and that is why we have to stick certain pairs of materials to notice the charging on rubbing the bodies. 1.3 Conductors and Insulators a metal rod held in hand and rubbed with wool will not show any sign of being charged. However, if the metal rod with a wooden or plastic handle is rubbed without touching its metal part, it shows the signs of charging. 
Suppose if we connect one end of the copper wire to a neutral pith ball and the other end to a negatively charged plastic rod, we will find that the pith ball acquires a negative charge if a similar experiment is repeated with a nylon thread or a rubber band, no transfer of charge will take place from plastic ball to the pith ball. Why does the transfer of charge not take place from the rod to the ball? Some substances readily show passage of electricity to them and others do not. Those which allow electricity to pass through them easily are called conductors. They have electric charges that are comparatively free to move inside the material. Metals, human and animal bodies and earth are conductors. Most of the non-metals like glass, porcelain, plastic, nylon, wood offer high resistance to the passage of electricity to them. They are called insulators. Most of the substances fall into one of the two classes stated above. When some charge is transferred to a conductor, it readily gets distributed over the entire surface of the conductor. In contrast, if some charge is put on an insulator, it stays at the same place. You will learn why this happens in the next chapter. This property of the materials tells you why a nylon or plastic comb gets electrified on combing dry hair or on rubbing, but a metal article like spoon does not. The charges on the metal leak through the body on the ground as both are conductors of electricity. When we bring a charged body in contact with the earth, all the excess charge on the body disappears by causing momentary current to pass to the ground through connecting conductor. This process of sharing the charges with earth is called grounding or earthing. Earthing provides a safety measure for electrical circuits and appliances. A thick metal plate is buried deep into the earth and the thick wires are drawn from this plate. These are used in buildings for the purpose of earthing near the main supply. The electric wiring in our houses has three wires, life, neutral and earth. The first two carry electric current from the power station and the third is earthed by connecting it to the buried metal plate. Metallic bodies of electric appliances such as electric iron, refrigerator, TV are connected to the earth wire. When any fault occurs or live wire touches the metallic body, the charge flows into the earth without damaging the appliance and without causing any injury to the humans. This would have otherwise been unavoidable since the human body is a conductor of electricity. 1.4 Charging by Induction When we touch a pith ball with an electrified plastic rod, some of the negative charges in the rod are transferred to the pith ball and it also gets charged. Thus, the pith ball is charged by contact. It is then repelled by the plastic rod but is attracted by the glass rod which is oppositely charged. However, why electrified rod attracts light objects is a question we still have left unanswered. Let us try to understand what could be happening by performing two of the following experiments. Number 1. Bring two metal spheres A and B supported on insulating stands as shown in contact. Number 2. Bring a positively charged rod near one of the spheres, say A, taking care that it does not touch the sphere. The free electrons in the spheres are attracted towards the rod. This leaves an excess of positive charge on the rear surface of sphere B. Both kinds of charges are bound to the metal spheres and cannot escape. They therefore reside on the surfaces as shown in figure 1.4b. The left surface of the sphere A has an excess of negative charge and the right surface of sphere B has an excess of positive charge. However, not all the electrons in the spheres have accumulated on the left surface of A. As the negative charge starts building up at the left surface of A, other electrons are repelled by this. In a short time, equilibrium is reached under the action of the force of attraction of the rod and the force of repulsion due to the accumulated charges shows that the equilibrium situation. The process is called induction of charge and happens almost instantly. The accumulated charges remain on the surface as shown till the glass rod is held near the sphere. If the rod is removed, the charges are not acted by any outside force and they redistribute to their original neutral state. Number 3. Separate the spheres by the small distance while the glass rod is still held near the sphere A, as shown in figure 1.4c. The two spheres are found to be oppositely charged and attract each other. Number 4. Remove the rod and charges on the sphere rearrange themselves as shown in figure 1.4d. Now, separate spheres quite apart, the charges on them get uniformly distributed all over them as shown in figure 1.4d. In this process, the metal spheres will be each equal and oppositely charged. This is charging by induction. The positively charged glass rod does not lose any of its charge contrary to the process of charging by contact. 
when the electrified rods are brought near light objects a similar effect takes place the rods induce positive charges on the near surfaces of the objects and similar charges move to the farther side of the object this happens even when the light object is not a conductor the mechanism for how this happens is explained later in section 1.10 and 2.10 the centers of the two types of charges are slightly separated we know that opposite charges attract while similar charges repel however the magnitude of force depends upon the distance between the charges and this is the case the force of attraction overweighs the force of repulsion as a result the particles like bits of paper or bit balls being light are pulled towards the rods I'm skipping example 1.1 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now. 1.5 basic properties of electric charge. We have seen that there are two types of charges namely positive and negative and their effects tend to cancel each other. Here we shall now describe some of the other properties of the electric charge. If the sizes of charged bodies are very small as compared to the distance between them, we treat them as point object. All the charge content of the body is assumed to be concentrated at one point in the space. 1.5.1 Additivity of Charges We have not yet given a quantitative definition of a charge. We shall follow it up in the next section. We shall tentatively assume that this can be done and proceed. If a system contains two point charges, Q1 and Q2, the total charge of the system is obtained by simply adding algebraically Q1 and Q2, that is, charges add up like real numbers or they are scalar like the mass of the body. If a system contains n charges q1, q2, q3 and so on till qn, then the total charge of the system is q1 plus q2 plus q3 and so on till plus qn. Charges has magnitude but no direction similar to mass. However, there is one difference between mass and charge. Mass of a body is always positive whereas charge can either be positive or negative. Proper signs have to be used while adding the charges in a system. For example, the total charge of a system containing 5 charges plus 1 plus 2 minus 3 plus 4 and minus 5 and some arbitrary unit is plus 1 plus plus 2 plus minus 3 plus plus 4 plus minus 5 which is equal to minus 1 in the same unit. 1.5.2 Charge is conserved We have already hinted to the fact that when bodies are charged by rubbing, there is transfer of electrons from one body to the other. No new charges are either created or destroyed. A posture of particles of electric charges enables us to understand the idea of conservation of charge. When we rub two bodies, what one body gains is in charge, the other body loses. We rub two bodies, what one body gains in charge, what other body loses. Within an isolated system consisting of many charged bodies due to interactions among the bodies, charges may get distributed but it is found that the total charge of the isolated system is always conserved. Conservation of charge has been established experimentally. It is not possible to create or destroy net charge carried by an isolated system although the charge carrying particles may be created or destroyed in a process. Sometimes nature creates charged particles. A neutron turns into a proton and an electron. The proton and electron thus created have equal and opposite charges and the total charge is zero before and after the creation. 1.5.3 Quantization of Charge Experimentally, it is established that all free charges are integral multiples of a basic unit of charge denoted by E. Thus, charge Q on a body is always given by Q is equal to NE, where N is an integer positive or negative. This basic unit of charge is the charge that an electron or proton carries. By convention, the charge on an electron is taken to be negative. Therefore, charge on an electron is written as minus E and that on a proton as plus E. The fact that electric charge is always an integral multiple of E is termed as quantization of charge. There is a large number of situations in physics where certain physical quantities are quantized. The quantization of charge was first suggested by experimental laws of electrolysis given by English experimentalist Faraday. It was experimentally demonstrated by Millikan in 1912. In the international system of units, a unit of charge is called Coulomb and is denoted by the symbol C. The Coulomb is defined in terms of a unit of electric current by which you are going to learn the subsequent chapter. In the terms of its definition, one Coulomb is the charge flowing through a wire in one second if the current is 1 ampere. 
in this system the value of basic unit of charge is equals to 1.602192 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb thus there are about 6 into 10 to the power 18 electrons in a charge of minus 1 coulomb in electrostatics charges of this large magnitude are seldom encountered hence we use smaller units like 1 micro coulomb which is equal to 10 to the power minus 6 coulomb or 1 milli coulomb which is equal to 10 to the power minus 3 coulomb if the proton and electrons are the only basic charges in the universe, all observable charges have to be integral multiples of E. Thus, if a body contains n1 electrons and n2 protons, the total number of charge on the body is n2 into E plus n1 into minus E, which is equal to n2 minus n1E. Since n1 and n2 are integers, their difference is also an integer. Thus, the charge on a body is always an integral multiple of E and can be increased or decreased up steps of E. The step size E is however very small because of the macroscopic level. We deal with charges of a few micro coulomb. At this scale, the fact that the charge of a body can increase or decrease in units of E is not visible. In this respect, the grainy nature of a charge is lost and it appears to be continuous. This situation can be compared with the geometrical concepts of points and lines. A dotted line viewed from a distance appears continuous but is not continuous in reality. As many points very close to each other normally give an impression of a continuous line, many small charges taken together appear as a continuous charge distribution. At a macroscopic level, one deals with charges that are enormous compared to the magnitude of charge E. Since E is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb, a charge of magnitude, say 1 micro coulomb, contains something like 10 to the power 13 times the electronic charge. At this scale, the fact that charge can increase or decrease only in units of E is not very different from saying that charge can take continuous values. Thus, at macroscopic level, the quantization of charge has no practical consequence and can be ignored. However, at the microscopic level, where the charges involved are of the order of few tens or hundreds of E, they can be counted. They appear in discrete lumps and quantization of charge cannot be ignored. It is the magnitude of the scale involved that is very important. I am skipping example 1.2 and 1.3 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video. I will solve them right now. 1.6 Coulomb's Law Coulomb's Law is a quantitative statement about the force between the two point charges. When the linear charge of charged bodies are much smaller than the distance separating them, the size may be ignored and the charged bodies are treated as point charges. Coulomb measured the force between two point charges and found that it varied inversely as the square of the distance between the charges and was directly proportional to the product of magnitude of the two charges acted along the line joining two charges. Thus, if two point charges Q1 and Q2 are separated by a distance R in vacuum, the magnitude of force F between them is given by F is equal to K Q1 Q2 upon R squared. How did Coulomb arrive at this law from his experiments? Coulomb used a torsion balance for measuring the force between the two charged metallic spheres. When the separation between two spheres is much larger than the radius of each sphere, the charged spheres may be regarded as point charges. However, the charges on the spheres were unknown to begin with. How then could it discover a relation like that? Coulomb thought of the following simple way. Suppose the charge on the metallic sphere is Q. If the sphere is put in contact with an identical uncharged sphere, the sphere will separate over the two spheres. By symmetry, charge on each sphere will be Q by 2. Repeating this process, we can get charges of Q by 2, Q by 4, etc. Coulomb varied the distance for a fixed pair of charges and measured the force for different separations. He then varied the charges in pairs, keeping the distance fixed for each pair. Comparing the forces for different pairs of charges and different distances, Coulomb arrived at the relation. Coulomb's law, a simple mathematical statement, was initially experimentally arrived at the manner described above. While the original experiment established at the microscopic scale, it also has to be established down to subatomic level. Coulomb discovered his law without knowing the implicit value of the charge. In fact, it is the other way round. Coulomb's law can now be employed to furnish a definition for a unit of charge in the relation. K is so far arbitrary. We can choose any positive value of K. 
The unit of k determines the size of the charge. In SI units, the value of k is about 9 into 10 to the power 19 newton meter square per coulomb square. The unit of charge that results from this choice is called the coulomb, which we defined earlier in section 1.4. Putting this value of k in the equation, we see that q1 equals to q2 is equal to 1 coulomb, r1 equals to 1 meter, then f is equal to 9 into 10 to the power 9 newton. That is, one coulomb is the charge that when placed at a distance of one meter from one another of the same magnitude in vacuum experiences an electrical force of repulsion of magnitude 9 into 10 to the power 9 newton. One coulomb is evidently too big unit to be used. In practice, in electrostatics, we use smaller units like one milliculomb or one microculum. The constant k in the equation is usually put as k equals to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught for convenience so that the Coulomb's law is written as f is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 upon r square where e naught is called the permittivity of free space. The value of epsilon naught in SI units is epsilon naught is equal to 8.854 into 10 to the power minus 12 Coulomb square per newton per meter square. Since force is a vector, it is better to write the Coulomb's law on the vector notation. Let the position vectors of charges q1 and q2 be r1 and r2 respectively. We denote force on q1 due to q2 by f12 and force on q2 due to q1 by f21. The two point charges q1 and q2 have been numbered 1 and 2 for convenience and the vector leading from 1 to 2 is denoted by r21 where r21 is equal to r2 minus r1. In the same way, the vector leading from 2 to 1 denoted by r12 is equal to r1 minus r2 which is equal to minus r21. The magnitude of the vectors r21 and r12 is denoted by r21 and r12 respectively. The direction of the vector is specified by a unit vector along the vector. To denote the direction from 1 to 2, we define the unit vectors. Coulomb's force law between two charges q1 and q2 located at r1 and r2 respectively is then expressed as f21 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 upon r21 whole square and unit vector r21. Some remarks of the equations are relevant. Point 1. Equation is valid for any sign of q1 and q2 whether positive or negative. If q1 and q2 of the same sign, either both positive or both negative, f21 is along r21 which denotes repulsion as it should be for like charges. If q1 and q2 are of opposite signs, f21 is along minus r21 which denotes attraction as expected for unlike charges. Thus, we do not have to write separate equations for the cases of like and unlike charges. The equation takes care of both the cases correctly. Point 2. The force F12 on charge Q1 due to charge Q2 is obtained from the equation by simply interchanging 1 and 2. That is, F12 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 upon R12 whole square unit vector R12, which is equal to minus F21. Thus, Coulomb law agrees with the Newton's third law. Point number 3. Coulomb's law gives the force between two charges Q1 and Q2 in vacuum. If the charges are placed in a matter for intermediate space as matter, the situation gets complicated due to the presence of charged constituents of matter. We shall consider electrostatics in the matter in the next chapter. I am skipping example 1.4 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now. Point 7. Forces between multiple charges. The mutual electric force between two charges is given by Coulomb's law. How to calculate the force on a charge where there are not one but several charges around? Consider a system of n stationary charges Q1, Q2, Q3 and so on till Qn in vacuum. What is the force on Q1 due to Q2, Q3 and Qn? Coulomb's law is not enough to answer this question. Recall that forces of mechanical origin add according to the parallelogram law of addition. Is the same true for the forces of electrostatic origin? Experimentally, it is verified that force on any charge due to number of other charges is the vector sum of all the forces on that charge due to other charges taken one at a time. The individual forces are unaffected due to the presence of other charges. This is termed as principle of superposition. To better understand the concept, consider a system of three charges Q1, Q2 and Q3 as shown. Other charges 
The force on one charge, say Q1 due to two other charges Q2 and Q3, can therefore be obtained by performing a vector addition of the forces due to each one of these charges. Thus, if the force on Q1 due to Q2 is denoted by F12, then F12 is given by the equation F12 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 upon R12 whole square unit vector R12. In the same way, force on Q1 due to Q3 is denoted by F13 is given by F13 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q3 upon 1 R13 whole square R13 vector which again is coulomb force on q1 due to q3 even though out of the charges q2 is present thus the total force f1 on q1 due to two charges q2 and q3 is given as f1 is equal to f12 plus f13 is equal to 1 upon 4 by epsilon naught q1 q2 upon r12 square r12 plus 1 upon 4 by epsilon naught q1 q3 r13 r13 the above calculation of force can be generalized to a system of charges more than 3 as shown in figure 1.8b. The principle of superposition says that in a system of charges Q1, Q2 till Qn, the force on Q1 due to Q2 is same as given by Coulomb's law Q2, Qn. The force on Q1 due to Q2 is same as given by Coulomb's law that is it is unaffected by the presence of other charges Q2, Q4, Q3, Qn. The total force on F1 on the charge Q1 due to all other charges is then given by the vector sum of the forces F12, F13 and so on till F1n. Therefore, F1 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q1, Q2, R12 whole square plus R12 plus Q1, Q3, R13 whole square plus R13 and so on. So, F1 is equal to Q1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught summation of Q initial upon R. 1 initial whole square R1 initial. The vector sum is obtained as usual by the parallelogram law of addition of vectors. All the electrostatics is basically on a consequence of Coulomb's law and superposition principle. I am skipping example 1.6. For you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now. One point eight electric field. Let us consider a point charge Q placed in vacuum at the origin O. If we place another point charge Q at the point P, where OP is equal to R, the charge Q will exert a force on Q as per Coulomb's law. We may ask a question: If the charge Q is removed, then what is left in the surrounding? Is there in nothing? If there is nothing at point P, then how does a force act? when we place a charge Q at P. In order to answer such questions, early scientists introduced the concept of field. According to this, we say that charge Q produces an electric field everywhere in the surrounding. When another charge Q is brought at the same point P, the field there acts on it and produces a force. The electric field produced by the charge Q at a given point R is given as E is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q upon R squared unit vector R is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught q upon r square unit vector r where r vector is equal to magnitude of r upon r. It is a unit vector from the origin to the point r. Thus the equation specifies the value of electric field for each value of the position vector r. The word field signifies how some distributed quantity which could be scalar or a vector varies with position. The effect of the charge has been incorporated in the resistance of electric field. We obtain the force F exerted by charge Q on the charge Q as F is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught capital Q small q upon R square unit vector R. Note that the charge Q also exerts an equal and opposite force on the charge capital Q. The electrostatic force between the charges capital Q and small q can be looked upon as an interaction between the charge small q and the electric field of the capital Q and vice versa. If we denote the position of charge small q by the vector small r, it experiences a force F equals to the charge small q multiplied by the electric field E at the equation of Q. Thus, F is equal to QE. The equation defines the SI unit of electric field as Newton per Coulomb. Some important remarks may be made here. Number 1. From the equation, we can infer that small q is unity. 
the electric field due to the charge capital q is numerically equal to the force exerted by it thus the electric field due to the charge capital q at a point in space may be defined as the force that a unit positive charge would experience if placed at a point the charge capital q which is producing the electric field is called a source charge and the charge small q which is test the effect of a source charge is called the test charge note that the source charge capital q must remain at its original location however if the charge small q is brought at any point around capital q capital q itself is bound to experience an electrical force due to the small q and will tend to move a way out of this difficulty is to make small q negligibly small the force f is then negligibly small but the force ratio f upon small q is finite and defines the electric field so e is equal to limit of f upon small q a practical way to get around this problem is to hold capital q to its location by unspecified forces this may look strange but actually this is what happens in practice when we are considering the electric force on a test charge q due to the charge planner sheet the charges on the sheet are held in their locations by forces due to unspecified charge constituent inside the sheet number 2 note that the electric field e due to q though defined operationally in terms of the term test charge q is independent of q this is because f is proportional to q so the ratio f upon q does not depend upon q the force f on the charge q due to the charge capital q depends upon the particular location of charge small q which may take any value in space around the charge plus q thus electric field e due to q is also dependent upon the space coordinate r for different positions in the charge q all over the space we get different values of electric field e and the field exists as every point in three dimensional space number 3 for a positive charge the electric field will be directed radially outward from the charge on the other hand the source charge is negative the electric field vector at each point is points radially inwards number 4 since the magnitude of the force f on the charge q due to charge capital q depends only upon the distance r of the charge small q from capital q the magnitude of electric field will also depend only on the distance r this equal distances from the charge capital q the magnitude of electric field e is same magnitude of electric field e due to the point charge is the same on the sphere with point charge at its center in other words it has a spherical symmetry create one electric field due to a system of charges consider a system of charges q1 q2 and so on till qn with position vectors r1 r2 and so on till rn relative to some origin o like the electric field at a point in space due to a single charge electric field at a point in space due to system of charges is defined to be the force experienced by a unit test charge placed at that point without disturbing the original positions of charges q1 q2 and so on till qn we can use coulomb's law and the superposition principle to determine this field at point p denoted by position vector r The electric field E1 at R due to Q1 at R1 is given by E1 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 upon R1P whole square R1P unit vector where R1P is a unit vector in the direction from the Q1 to P and R1P is the same distance between Q1 and P. In the same manner, electric field E2 at R due to Q2 at R2 is E2 is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q2 upon R1P. 2p whole square r2p where r2p is a unit vector in a direction from q2 to p and r2p is the distance between q2 and p similar expressions hold good for the fields e3 e4 till en due to charges q3 q4 till qn by the superposition principle the electric field e at r due to system of charges is e is equal to e1 plus e2 and so on till en which is equal to the 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught summation of qi upon r1p whole square r1p e is a vector quantity that varies from one point to another point in space and is determined by the positions of source charges 1.8.2 physical significance of electric field you may wonder why the notion of electric field has been introduced here at all after all for any system of charges the measurable quantity is the force on a charge which can be directly de- determined using coulomb's law and superposition principle why then introduce this intermediate quantity called the electric field 
For the electrostatics, the concept of the electric field is convenient but not really necessary. The electric field is an elegant way of characterizing the electrical environment of a system of charges. Electric field at a point in space around the system of charges tells you the force a unit positive test charge should experience if placed at that point. Electric field is a characteristic of the system of charges and is independent of the test charge that you place at a point to determine the field. The term field in physics really refers to the quantity that is defined at every point in space and may vary from one point to another. Electric field is a vector field since force is a vector quantity. The true physical significance of the concept of electric field, however, emerges only when we go beyond electrostatics and deal with time-dependent electromagnetic phenomena. Suppose we consider a force between two distance charges Q1 and Q2 in accelerated motion. Now the greatest speed with which a signal or information can go from one point to another is C, the speed of light. Thus, the effect of any motion on Q2 of on Q1 cannot arise instantaneously. There will be some time delay between the effect and the cause. It is precisely here that the notion of electric field is naturally and very useful. The field picture in this, the accelerated motion of charge Q1 produces electromagnetic waves which then propagates with the speed C and reaches Q2 and causes a force on Q2. The notion of field elegantly accounts for the time delay. Thus, even though charges and magnetic field can be detected only by the effects on charges, they are regarded as physical entities, not merely mathematical constructs. They have an independent dynamics of their own, that is, they evolve according to the laws of their own. They can also transport energy, thus the source of time-dependent electromagnetic field turn on for a short interval of time and then switched off, leaves behind propagating electromagnetic fields transporting energy. The concept of field was first introduced by Faraday and is now among the central concepts in physics. I am skipping example 1.8 for you to solve it later or you may pause the video and solve it right now. One point nine electric field lines. We have studied electric field in the last section. It is a vector quantity and can be represented as we represent vectors. Let us try to represent E due to a point charge pictorially. Let the point charge be placed at our origin. Draw vectors pointing along the direction of the electric field in the lens proportional to the strength at the field at each point. Since the magnitude of electric field at a point decreases inversely as the square of the distance of that point from the charge, the vector gets shorter as one goes away from the origin, always pointing radially outward. Figure 1.15 shows such a picture. In this figure, the arrow indicates the electric field, that is, the force acting on a unit positive charge placed at the tail of the arrow. Connect the arrows pointing in one direction and the resulting figure helps in a field line. We thus get many field lines all pointing outwards from a point charge. Have we lost the information about the strength or magnitude of the field now? because it was contained in the length of an arrow? No. Now the magnitude of the field is represented by the density of electric field lines. E is strong near the charge, so the density of the field lines is more the charge and lines are closer. Away from the charge, the field gets weaker and the density of field lines is less, resulting in well-separated lines. Another person may draw more lines, but the line number of lines is not important. In fact, an infinite number of lines can be drawn in any region. It is the relative density of lines in different regions which is important. We draw the figure on the plane of paper that is two dimensions but we live in three dimensions. So if one wishes to estimate the density of field lines, one has to consider the number of lines per unit cross-sectional area perpendicular to the lines. Since the electric field decreases as the square of the distance from the point charge and the area enclosing the charge increases as the square of the distance, the number of field lines crossing the enclosing area remains contact whatever may be the distance of the area from the charge. We started by saying that the field lines carry information about the direction of the electric field at different points in space. Having drawn a certain set of field lines, the relative density of the field lines at different points indicates the relative strength of electric field at those points. The field lines crowd where the field is strong and are placed apart where it is weak. Figure 1.16 shows a set of field lines. We can imagine two equal and small elements of area placed at points R and cutting the area elements is proportional to the magnitude of field at these points. The picture shows that the field at R is stronger than S. 
to understand the dependence of the field lines on area or other than the solid angle subtended by an area element let us try to relate the area with the solid angle a generalization of the angle to three dimensions recall how an angle is defined in two dimensions let a small transverse line element delta l be placed at the distance r from point o then the angle subtended at delta h at o can be approximated as delta theta is equal to delta l upon r likewise three dimensions the solid angle subtended by a very small angle perpendicular plane area delta s at the distance r can be written as delta omega is equal to delta s upon r square we know that given solid angle the number of radial field lines is the same in figure 1.16 for two points p1 and p2 at distances r1 and r2 from the charge the element of area subtending the solid angle delta omega is r1 square delta omega at p1 and an element of area r2 square delta omega at p2 respectively the number of lines say n cutting these area elements are the same the number of lines cutting unit area element is therefore n upon r1 square delta omega at p1 and n1 upon r2 square delta omega at p2 respectively since n and delta omega are common the strength of electric field clearly has 1 upon r square dependence the picture of field lines may, was invented by faraday to develop an intuitive and non-mathematical way of visualizing electric fields around charged configurations faraday calls them lines of force the term is somewhat misleading especially in case of magnetic fields the more the appropriate term field lines that we have adopted in this book electric field lines are thus a way of pictorially mapping the electric field around the configuration of charges an electric field line in general a curve is drawn such a way that a tangent to each at each point is in the direction of net field at a point an arrow on the curve obviously necessary to specify the direction of electric field from two possible directions indicated by a tangent to a curve a field line is a space curve that is a curve in three dimensions figure 1.17 shows the field lines around a simple charge configurations as mentioned earlier the field lines are in three dimensional space though the figure shows them only in a plane the field lines of a single positive charge are radially outward while those of a single negative charge are radially inward the field lines around the system of two positive charges give a vivid pictorial descriptions of the mutual repulsion while those around the configuration of two equal and opposite charges q1 minus q are dipoles show clearly the mutual attraction between the charges the field lines follow some important general properties number 1 Field lines start from positive charges and end at negative charges. If there is a single charge, they may start or end at infinity. Number two, in a charge-free region, electric field lines can be taken to be continuous curves without any breaks. Number three, two field lines can never cross each other. If they did, the field at a point of intersection will not have a unique direction, which is absurd. Number four, electrostatic field lines do not form any closed loops. This follows the conservation of nature of electric field. So that's it for today. We'll continue with electric pulse in part 2 of this chapter. Till then, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned. Thank you.